In this episode of Detroit Performs, an artist questions, is it ever possible to truly rest? A painter develops her own style of urban portraiture and a niche for nature. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. What's up guys and welcome to the eighth season of Detroit Performs. This season, we're gonna hit you up with an array of different artists, including play sculptors, graffiti jewelry makers, classically trained musicians, Vogue dancers, and so much more. But tonight, we are here at the David Klein Gallery, kicking things off with a Silver Point artist and muralist who asked the question in his latest exhibition, is it possible for us to truly rest? Here is Mario Moore. interested in like creating a stage that the audience can kind of come into. Art to me has always been involved in my life. I grew up around the DIA. I used to go visit the museum when I was a kid. I would walk through the galleries. But as far as like inspiration, uh, that came from my mom, Sabrina Nelson, because you know, she, I would see her do these large paintings. Just the idea to look at a canvas that's blank or a piece of paper and her just like make something was always uh, interesting to me. The way that I begin my work is usually through uh, sketches and ideas. It's usually that I have a thought and I have a process and I sketch out or I think about that thought and I say what is the best way to portray this thought or to talk about this idea. So that can go to sculpture, that can go to drawing, that can go to video, that can go to painting, but the majority of the time, I'm interested in like a massive narrative. We're in the David Klein Gallery, and the show is called Recovery. And the show is about considering how black men uh, rest and relax and take time for themselves. What happened was I was working on a body of work where I was thinking about myself personally and how I move my body through the world and how the world considers me as a black man. And then I had brain surgery. I had brain surgery and literally I was forced to rest. So that, that made me think about things historically, like how did historic black men that we you know, we know and the world knows, like a Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X or a W.E.B. Du Bois, and, and when we look up their names, they're always speaking really loud, they're on the podium, they're always active. Like, in times of turmoil, like what we're dealing with today, as far as everything politically and socioeconomically, how do I rest? Because we're kind of in a, we're in a similar state. And in some ways, in some senses, as far as education and other things like that, it's, it's worse. It's gone backwards instead of forwards. So, but I'm, I'm at the same time, we're human. So these men took vacations. They uh, took time with their family. They took naps. So I started to think about that. And the work presents a question because I don't have the answer. So how do black men rest? How do they relax? And what does that look like? It has to do with just the history of America in that Black men and black people, just in general, we're in the process of constantly having to stay ahead, right? Um, to just to catch up economically. Since we got to the country or the Americas, we were slaves, you know, we were, it, was a, it was things that the country were, were built on the labor that we put in. So that is passed down as far as trying to catch up. You have to work extremely hard. So the idea of resting and relaxing is not a part of the process when you're always thinking about what do I need to do next? 
Silver point is a technique that was used in the 16th and 15th century and is literally a piece of silver and drawing with a piece of silver. Most of the silver point drawings um, that have the historical, like the larger ones that have the historical figures in the background, it's a, it's a concept and idea is that can a black man look relaxed and calm and present himself in that way, but also at the same time be powerful? Like, I'm letting the background, you know, the historical figures do all the work for me while I relax. And I think that's, you know, a part of the importance and a part of the process. I like the amount of texture and detail that went into the silver point, but there's a, a, a limited number of values that can, you can reach. So no matter what I draw, no matter how hard the subject matter is, it's always going to be this softness to it. And I really like that. The other thing I really like about silver point is that you can't erase. So it's almost like drawing with a pen, like whatever you put down is permanent, right? So, so everything that goes into that drawing, you have to deal with it, right? It's, it's there to exist forever. Another thing I like is that in dealing with silver point, you're, you're literally leaving behind silver on paper. So you're creating something that has an initial value. Um, and with the work that I was working on, I'm dealing with the subject matter that people don't see as valuable. America often sees as invaluable as far as black men and also this idea of rest and this idea of relaxing. So I think that material has worked for me really well in thinking about these ideas and concepts. There's one piece in particular in the show. I read this book called Medical Apartheid. Uh, it has to do with the experimentation on black people from slavery to contemporary times. And I also got this uh, huge photography book called uh, Stiff Skulls and Skeletons. Through that book, you can see how they like experimented and practiced on cadavers. And the most of the cadavers you will see are um, black or African-American cadavers. And the way that that happened is they were like, well, we don't really care about this community, so we can dig up these graves and use these bodies. Right, so those bodies became objects. They weren't even people anymore. So it was like, well, the thing that just happened to me with my brain surgery, what would that look like you know, back in these times? And I wanted to show opposition to that, that shine the light on me as a person, as a human being instead of an object, and kind of like mute the light on the figures that are above me. The American Bulldog, for me, it's a literal representation of the history of America, and I use it as a symbol for America itself. And often, uh, you'll find the dog is sleeping or relaxing as it's ignoring um, really big issues that are happening right above it. I include history in my work because as far as social issues, we kind of roll around all the time back to similar issues over and over again. So I look at the past and I consider it and I'm saying, well, what was happening then kind of looks like now. What did they do then? What can we do now? What can we do to change it? And what does that look like? I think there's a ton of stuff to take away from this show. I think about a lot of different narratives that go into one piece, but there's a lot of stuff that I don't think about. And I think those are the important things that uh, people that come and see the show that they can pull out for themselves. I think it's important for the people to answer. Well, these are the things that I've noticed. These are some ideas that I'm thinking about. This is a question that I have. And I think it, it becomes more participatory that the people that come and see the show, they provide the answers. I think hearing their perspective and hearing their ideas about resting and what that looked like for them was extremely important. I think uh, hearing my dad talk about how he's worked since he was 16 years old and talking about his perspective was important. But I think the most important thing that happened after the show was I went into the barber shop and uh, one of the barbers that was in there, he told me after seeing my show, he literally took a week off of work. And then also hearing that uh, several men, you know, after seeing the show were going outside and crying, you know, which is like, like that, that they honestly never thought in this way. So I think those were probably the most important things that, that happened. You can learn more about Mario Moore as well as all the artists that we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Next up, Desiree Kelly is taking classic portraiture up a notch. She puts her spin on her portraits, capturing the subject's essence by including artifacts and phrases in the backgrounds of her pieces. Take a look.
try to go beyond like the boundaries. I just want to speak really through my art. I find it really powerful to be able to tell a story visually without any words. My paintings are all about the subjects and it's all about telling their story and I want to tell it in a very vibrant, energetic way that people want to know about these people. So I've studied art and I wanted to make it more interesting. I came to the point where, where I was in college and I wanted to decorate my first apartment and I don't want to hang a flower on my wall. That's not the type of person I am and I wanted to make something that was just something you would never find it so I had to create it myself. So the subjects that I pick are people that I'm interested in and music is just always kept with me so you find a lot of musicians that I paint um, like Louis Armstrong, uh, Jimi Hendrix and I just want to tell their personality what I feel about them because it is their portrait um, and I want to make it more interesting and uh, sort of tell their story and that someone that you know it's 10 years old can look at a piece that I create and learn a little bit of something by looking at the piece. The foundation is oil paint, spray paint, and collage. I have evolved to use other uh, mediums like uh, markers, acrylic paint. Um, it really depends on the subject and what I want to convey and how to do it. And there's some things that you can't paint. Like you have to use physical items that you find and it really creates another depth for my, for my art. Um, it gives it texture. If the person is a little bit more edgy or contemporary or reserved, um, it's really what I want to convey from their, their personality. So for example, I have uh, like a Danny Brown piece and he's really like wild and you know, Detroit and edgy. And so I used a lot of uh, collage and spray paint to build up the background of that piece, but the foundation is uh, oil paint for the actual figure. Abe Lincoln is one of my most iconic pieces that I've done. I thought he was just a really interesting guy because he was a boxer and you know he's all these crazy things that no one would ever know about him. So when I did my research about him, all you could find are black and white photos. And I wanted to bring that to modern day, so you have to add color, put him out of context, sort of like in modern day. And what I did for my first rendition of him was put him like in front of a graffiti wall that's at four score and he's like taking a picture of himself with like a 35 millimeter camera and he has like a tuxedo on. It was just made like him as a character that brought him to life. And I've since then, like I've done uh, several murals of him actually with these kaleidoscope glasses that I think are just pretty cool. And it sort of just makes him like a, like an icon of today instead of just being stale in history. I use a lot of like, color and, and movement to try to capture you as long as possible and maybe put like a little bit of details, that hidden things that you may not see until you look at it for maybe like the fifth time. And my, my pieces are very diverse and they can be placed anywhere. They can be placed in a home or in a restaurant or, you know, for any, any particular venue. So it's really interesting that you can find or learn something by looking at a piece of mine. I have a Misty Copeland piece that I did. She's like a phenomenal person, and um, she's accomplished so many things and broken so many barriers. And so throughout her piece, I incorporated a lot of uh, like magazine covers and sort of iconic pieces out, like out of her timeline. And I chose this pose that was really sort of beautiful. Today I'm working on a Rob Zombie portrait is actually a part of a bigger project that I'm doing with a local restaurant, uh, Vegan, and I'm doing a series of uh, vegan musicians. It's in the early phases of painting. I do uh, multiple layers, like I first tone it with the brown and then I go back and add color. And I'm also working on uh, NWA piece, which I, I'm picking back up after, after a year of sitting it down. I had to really think about uh, what I wanted to do for the background and how I wanted to like, capture their essence within the piece. Like if I wanted to do a little bit more graffiti, add a little bit more of uh, spray paint and collage to that piece. And this guy, Easy e he's like right in the center. Like he's sort of like in the forefront of this 
and these guys are behind him. So I want to like highlight him, but also not have like the background overpower it. This is probably why I covered up a lot of this. It lends itself to being more of a quiet background because they're so in your face just with their, their gesture, their look. The phrases that I typically use uh, for a portrait are uh, song lyrics from that musician themselves, maybe uh, movies that they uh, were in. If it's something we're closer to home, like, uh, like a Danny Brown, I did do a bunch of like Detroit streets in the background, uh, like a Welcome Detroit uh, City Limit sign. Whatever that's per pertaining to that subject, um, I would include. And a lot of like artifacts, like actual like albums, and included that part of the piece. My message is all about telling the stories of iconic figures, historical figures. The way that I, I capture them can be placed in any setting, really, and spark a conversation. I'm loving all of Desiree's paintings, especially that NWA piece. Major props, Miss Kelly. Now, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. You won't find dresses designed by Mora Bateman on any fashion runway. That's because her unique designs are made of fabric and Minnesota's natural elements. Bateman breaks down her inspiration for her intricate collections here. natural materials more interesting. I like the textures and subtlety of them. And I think it goes back to my love of the landscape and nature. In the landscape, I tend to like things that are more subtle and textural, even in gardens, rather than bright colors. So I think natural materials in my work stems from that. I'm lucky enough to have my mom help me with some of my work some days each week. I started out my career as a landscape architect because I was interested in ecology and design and the natural world. And now that I'm working strictly as an artist, I'm also bringing those elements into the art I'm doing. One of the series I'm working on is a collection called Trace, Retrace. There are three dresses in the collection and this collection is inspired by a specific farm landscape in western Minnesota and I'm working from the maps and history of that farm. This is the shape of the Chippewa River at this location in western Minnesota and it's where my great-grandma and grandpa grew up. My great-grandpa lived on this side, the west side, they're the ones with the prairie fire. And my great-grandma grew up on this side, the safe side. I'm using bison wool and I love working with it as a native species and specifically documented on this exact farm site. The original dresses came from the idea of doing an installation based on a short story called The Hungry Girls by an author named Patricia Aikens. I wanted to depict these characters from her story 
They were giantesses that were living and working on a farm, eating everything in sight, eating the soil. They lived a very simplistic life. When I was rereading the short story, there was just one part of it where the characters were all fighting over one nightgown. And it was the only pretty thing in their life. And that's when I decided a nightgown might be a good way to represent the characters. I wanted to show the wild nature of these characters, just living by their instincts. Momenta Animale was an exhibition of the Hungry Girls pieces, just a room with nine eight-foot pieces hanging from horse yokes that you would just walk through these pieces towering above you. Once I started working on the project, it kind of went beyond just the story, and I started just thinking about life in general, growing old, having children, how the landscape changes over time, how we change over time with our experiences. This is one of the 10 dresses that I'm making this year. It's a really simple design. It's just made from one piece of fabric, and all I need to do is sew the sides. I haven't even cut out the neck holes yet. I'll do that after I dye each piece, and that will be based on the inspiration of the waterway at that site. I was awarded a 2014 Minnesota State Arts Board grant. I chose 10 ecological sites across the state of Minnesota. The first site I'm visiting is Great Cloud Dunes, where I am eco-dyeing a dress. Eco-dyeing is dyeing fabric with natural materials. I think what's really interesting about Grey Cloud Dunes is that fire is very important to that site. We were there right after the prairie burn, so there was all that terrific ash there. And then the fact that it's right on the Mississippi River. What an amazing place that is. A lot of the sites I'll be going to this summer are very pristine and very very wild, very remote. But this one is really close to the city and, and the river, so I found that really interesting and a good balance for the project. What I'm doing with eco-dyeing is bundling leaves and fallen vegetation in the fabric and letting it seep. I'm gonna leave it there for three weeks. Always really cool to be by the Mississippi River. Makes me think of the human history at the site and geologic history. That whole area just being formed by what's gone on for so long there. I'm just hoping the site will have a say in what these pieces end up looking like. I'm planning on embellishing the piece with more ideas about the site, with cutting and stitching and each one will be different and be inspired by that site. I'm hoping that each garment will actually be somewhat like a poem of that site. My education in landscape architecture was actually perfect for me. Learning about plants, native plants, geology, soils, site analysis, and all those things are really helpful with the work I'm doing. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank the David Klein Gallery for having us out here today, and we cannot wait to show you just what's in store for this season of Detroit Performs. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. 
Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by Masco Corporation is proud to manufacture innovative and environmentally friendly products for the home. Delta faucets, craft made in Marillat cabinets, and Bear Brand paints have all been designed with you in mind. Masco and its family of companies, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Funding is also provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs, the National Endowment for the Arts, the A. Paul and Carol C. Scott Foundation, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.